I mean, I'm very pleased to be here. It's a great honor, and I thank the organizers. It's been a great conference, great conference dinner as well. And I congratulate Hubert, of course, again. Um, so, unlike many people here, I actually have no idea when I first met Hubert. I don't remember. <laughs> I'm sure he was at some conference, maybe 10, 15 years ago. But I think I was probably too junior to dare to speak to him, I think, at the time. So, we got to know each other a bit more when he got interested in some of our work on non entanglement in non-unitary conformal flow theory, which, uh, um, I mean, on which he has done some interesting work as well. And also I had the privilege to sit in the commission for the thesis of two of his students in, in recent years. And uh, every time I did this, my feeling looking at this thesis was always, oh my God, he gave this problem to this poor student. And then when I finished reading, it was, wow, and the student actually did the problem. He solved the problem. So, <laughs> so I can say he has really excellent students, some of which are here, actually. And on a personal level, I have to say that uh, um, Uber has always been unfailingly kind to me, um, appreciative of my work, and supportive when I needed it for promotion. So I can only say thanks and wish him all the best. And whatever he does from now on, I, I hope it brings you joy, which is the most important thing. Okay, so one thing I think I might have in common with you, Bear, um, perhaps, is that I think we are both slightly obsessed with the sort of topics we worked on on our respective PhD theses. So Uber still does a lot of work on, of course, CFT, ON models, non-unitary theories. And uh, this uh, topic I'm gonna talk about today is also going back to my PhD thesis, which was actually almost exactly 20 years ago. I defended my PhD on the 31st of July, 2001. And in my PhD, I worked on a topic which is pretty niche. There are not many people in the world that are really interested in this. But I got drawn into this because my PhD supervisor in Spain was a specialist in this kind of theories. And the theories we were working on were quantum field theories, integral quantum field theories that had the peculiarity of possessing not only stable bound states, but also unstable particles in the spectrum. So there are actually finitely lived uh, excitations in these theories, and these finitely lived excitations, well, they can form and they can decay, so they give rise some, to some interesting physics that one doesn't find uh, very, use, very frequently in integrability, combined with integrability. So in my thesis, I studied uh, form factors, TBA, that sort of thing, but 20 years later, I was able to come back to this problem in the context of out of equilibrium dynamics. And I thought that, okay, once we have uh, uh, some dynamics in the problem, it would be interesting to see what these unstable particles do in this dynamic. Can we actually see them, kind of visualize how they form and how they decay in some way? And the answer to this is actually yes. You, you find some quite, well, I think we find some quite interesting results. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So this is based on a, a, cap, a few papers. So one, I mean, the first one, it's already published. There is a preprint. And then there is something we are working on at the moment and we hope to finish pretty soon. And this was done in collaboration with several people, which are here. So two students, Cecilia and Alexandra, and two co long-term collaborators, Francesco and, and Benjamin, whom I think most of you here would know. So I thank them because I've learned a lot doing this work with them, of course. So, um, so let me tell you a little bit the structure of the talk. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the specific model we, we, we studied. So this is a model that is part of a, of a big family. So this family of so-called homogeneous sine gordon models, uh, they're nothing to do with sine gordon really, so it's a bit misleading the name. They are actually diagonal, they have diagonal scattering. And they are a family in, in, in pretty much the same way that other uh, models are a family. So they are, this, they are associated with an algebraic structure. So you can have one such model for each simply lays algebra, essentially. The model we studied is actually the simplest in this whole family, the simplest non-trivial. And uh, one feature that this model has, uh, for example, is this kind of scaling function. So if you do a TBA study of the model, as I did in my thesis, and you look at the TBA scaling function, what you find is that this function has a staircase pattern with two steps, possibly, at most. And for other models of the same family, you can find many, many of these steps. So uh, the RG flow of the theory visits uh, a bunch of um, ultraviolet fixed points, 
And the reason for that uh, essentially is that at low temperature, so beta is the inverse temperature, at low temperature the model is essentially free, but when the temperature reaches a certain uh, threshold, a certain value, there's enough energy for this unstable particle to be formed. And so it contributes to the spectrum, and then the theory flows into a more complicated CFT, which is actually a, a Cosette CFT associated to, well, SU3 level 2. Uh, I mean, this is a perturbation of peso mino these models, if you, if you want to know the details. So, I mean, um, the details of the family don't matter. Let's just focus on this example. So um, the method we have used to study this is this generalized hydrodynamics uh, approach, which has already featured in this conference. Uh, Takato, in particular, used it very much yesterday, and I think it was possibly mentioned in a couple other talks. Um, so this is an approach to study out of equilibrium dynamics in integral models. And then I'll hopefully have time to show you a, a few results about, about this. So let's start with the model, this SU3 level 2. So this is a model that has two stable particles only. Okay, so it's very simple. These two stable particles interact, and uh, they can form this unstable particle when they interact. Uh, and um, the way uh, one, well, the way people often uh, visualize this in an algebraic way is that uh, this model is related to A2, so SU3, so an algebra with uh, two nodes in the thinking diagram. Each node is kind of one of these stable particles. And then the nodes are linked by uh, this link to which you can associate a parameter. And this parameter sort of measures the mass of this unstable particle. So if you, um, yeah, that's it. If you've made this parameter very big, the mass is very big, and so on. Um, so uh, and each, well, each of these nodes also stands for A1, the algebra A1, or if you wish, uh, as a theory, this would be the icing field theory. So you understand that when you look at the S matrix. So if you, if you label these two particles by plus and minus, which is convenient, so these are the particle types, uh, when they interact uh, with themselves, they interact as free fermions. So individually, each of them is like a free fermion. But when they meet, they interact in this non-trivial way with this scattering matrix. Okay? And as you can see, there is an interesting feature as well, which is that uh, the order in which they interact matters. So plus, minus, and minus plus is not the same. So parity is breaking in this model, and that also has some consequences. So when you look at physical quantities for each of these particles, you will see that they are generally not symmetric in rapidity space, uh, but they are kind of related to each other by some parity transformation. Now, uh, if you look at these S metrics, you see that actually has a, a pole. Well, these two S matrices have poles, and one of them has a pole exactly at this place, at sigma minus i pi half. Sigma is this. Uh, is an arbitrary real parameter. We'll take it to be positive. And uh, this pole, if you know a little bit about scattering theory in QFT, this is a pole that is in the unphysical strip because it has negative imaginary part. So it's not part of the physical spectrum. It has uh, some positive real part. So that's the sort of thing that uh, you would interpret as a signature of the formation of an unstable uh, bond, an unstable particle. If you use the bright big enough formula, you can actually use the position of this pole to compute the mass of this unstable particle and also its decay width. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, now one thing that would be very important for our work is uh, the logarithmic derivative of these S metrics because that's what we call, that's what enters the TBA equations that are at the heart of this GHD analysis. And when you, <clears throat> when you compute this, what you find is that this, uh, well, we call that uh, phi, this, this derivative. Ah, what did I do? OK, <laughs> sorry. I pressed the wrong button. Um, so this phi, of course, for, for S matrix constant, that is 0 for the non-interacting part. For, but for this, for this part, this is a 1 over cosh shifted by, by sigma. Um, now, that shifting is quite interesting because in integral QFT, if you're a bit familiar with total theories or Sinch Gordon or something like this, the kernels, they tend to be centered around rapidity 0. But here they are centered around some other rapidity. And what that means is that essentially interaction between particles is going to be maximized for a certain sign of the rapidity <coughs> and essentially non-existing non for the other sign of the rapidity. And this is something that has an effect later in some of the quantities I'll talk about. So one thing that you can see from these S metrics is that when sigma goes to infinity, this tangent goes to 1. And so what you have are two completely decoupled free fermions. 
Uh, on the other hand, when uh, sigma is much bigger than one, but not infinity, the bright big enough formula gives you an estimate of the mass of this unstable particle, and that mass is given by a formula proportional to this. So it scales with the exponential of sigma half, and that is why this quantity sigma half uh, plays such a role in, in many places. So it's, it, this is why it represents the energy, the energy threshold uh, to form that particle. So, and here you see <coughs> what these kernels uh, look like, so these this functions. So you see that, as I said, they will be picked around whatever the value of sigma is. So here is 20. So each of the kernels is picked around plus or minus 20. So essentially, if, if the two particles scatter with some rapidity, which is like minus 20 here, well, they kind of don't see each other. It's, it's as if they were purely just free. OK, so that's the theory, I mean, the, the model. Now, what else uh, can we say next? Well, let me say something about GHD. So, Takata talked about GHD yesterday, but I, I think it's fair to say it was pretty technical and a bit fast. So, I'm going to just give you a recap uh, on a kind of uh, more basic facts about it. So, um, I mean, GHD is an approach that has been, well, which allows you to um, describe the dynamics of systems out of equilibrium, particularly integrable systems, both quantum and also lattice. And it's based on hydrodynamics, the principle of hydrodynamics. So the idea that um, if you have a quantum system and you look at it at a mesoscopic scale, so you don't look at the whole system, neither do you look at individual particles, but you look at a bunch of particles, um, then in each of these uh, fluid cells, uh, if you wait a, a long time, or long enough, the system will eventually thermalize or equilibrate to a certain ensemble. Okay. So that's the, the basic idea. Um, so in conventional hydrodynamics, the sort of thing the fluid cell would equilibrate to uh, would be a Gibbs ensemble, normally, described by that, that sort of uh, partition function. But, um, and the input would be, well, the conservation laws of, of the system here. But if the system is integrable, people have realized, and this was mentioned, I think, several talks already, if the system is integral, we, we, integral, we will have many conservation laws, these QIs in here. And so instead of, in general, the system will not thermalize in the standard sense, it would equilibrate in the generalized Gibbs ensemble sense. So it will equilibrate to some uh, distribution that is described by some partition function like this. This is called a GG, generalized Gibbs ensemble. Now, <coughs> so, um, if you combine uh, this uh, hydrodynamic idea of entropy maximization with uh, this idea of GGEs, what comes is, uh, well, a solving procedure for these out of equilibrium situations. And this is something we discussed in, in a couple, well, in, in some papers. It was discussed in a paper where I'm co-author and also in a simultaneous one. It was discussed how, how this can be used in practice to solve problems. Um, there's also a recent review by Benjamin, which is quite nice about all this. Now, GG has been now generalized, uh, not GG, sorry, GHD has been extended to many situations since then. But here, I'm going to just use it in the most uh, basic formulation, so the one of 2016, really, what we did there. Um, so how do you actually solve anything? So, okay, these are all words I, I just said. So this is all very nice, GGs and so on. But if you want to solve a problem, where do you start? Uh, if the system is integrable, then you are at an advantage because uh, with integrability comes a very uh, suitable uh, quasi-particle description, which is given to us by the beta answers or the TBA if we want to take thermodynamic limit, if we are in QFT. And so a big ingredient that enters this GHD a solution procedure are TBA equations, which actually we just uh, heard about uh, a bit earlier. So um, I think you all know about TBA a little bit, but let me just uh, show you some of the basic equations. So um, uh, a basic equation in, t in the thermodynamic beta answers for quantum field theory, the starting point usually is an equation that looks like this. These are pseudo energies. So these are kind of the particle energies kind of dressed by the interaction. The interaction is packed into this term here. And this phi is these kernels that I defined earlier. So this logarithmic derivative of uh, S matrix. Here, for simplicity, I consider just a system with one particle. In our example, we would have a pair of such equations we have, because we have two particles. So, um, so uh, the equation looks like this. Um, and in the standard TBA, normally, 
the term that you would have here would be something like beta cos theta in a relativistic QFT. Um, so Ivan has been talking a lot about that just, just before. Um, so it would be beta cos theta. But if you have a GGE, so if you have uh, an ensemble that's more general, then what you have here instead is a sum over uh, all the one particle eigenvalues of the conserved quantities with some Lagrange multipliers, with some generalized inverse temperatures, some beta i's. And if you differentiate this equation with respect to those beta i's, you get another equation for the derivatives of these epsilons, which we generally call uh, the dressing equation. So that gives you a prescription to, for how this one particle conserved quantities get dressed, get modified by the presence of interaction. Now here I have some labels. So as I said, this is for a single particle. That symbol there represents a convolution, so there is an integration taking place. So these are integral equations. That is the kernel, so derivative of S metrics. This function for fermionic statistics, which is what we use here, is um, this L function. So this is a nonlinear equation uh, that depends on epsilon nonlinearly. And in there, um, sorry, uh, sorry, I'm, what's happening? Oh, something disappeared. So, oh, I think, eh? Um, sorry, it's not moving. <laughs> ah, okay, I don't know what happened. It's like this stuff working. Okay, these are the one particle eigenvalues I was talking about. So in particular, <clears throat> the first three, H0, which is particle number, uh, is usually one in relativistic QFT. H1 would be energy, which I take to cos theta. So I take the mass scale to be one of these particles. Uh, the next one would be momentum, sinh theta, and so on. So you have all these functions there. You also have a function here, n, okay? And this is what we usually call, okay? Um, Hmm. What we usually call the occupation number. Okay, so this is a function of the uh, pseudo energies in here. Okay, now in a genuine out of equilibrium situation, uh, what you have, as I showed you in the previous slide, in this fluid cell picture, what you have is equilibration on each fluid cell. So what you have is that these Lagrange multipliers here are now functions of, of position and time, of x and t. So it's a dynamical situation. And if these quantities are functions of x, t, actually everything else is also a function of rapidity, x, and t, including these functions here, these occupation numbers. Now, one of the most interesting results we got in those papers of 2016 was to realize that these, uh, these occupation numbers were what you call the normal modes of these hydrodynamic equations. So, in other words, it was to realize that these uh, occupation numbers satisfy a rather simple looking equation like this. Okay? And that, in fact, if you can essentially compute in these occupation numbers, you have a full description of the state of the system as, the, as it evolves in time. So these are the crucial things one tries to compute, normally numerically. They satisfy this kind of equation, and here in this equation there is a function, which is the effective velocity, which is quite an important function in all this formulation, which Takato also talked about yesterday. And it's defined in there. So formally, this is the ratio of the energy prime dressed or P prime dressed. So in relativistic uh, QFT, this is P dressed or energy dressed, okay? Cos and sinh. So this is the effective velocity. All right. So in our work, I mean, in what I'm gonna, when I come to the results section, I'm gonna show you pictures of uh, this effective velocity in particular, because it's an interesting quantity that actually has some distinct features that reveal the presence of this unstable particle. Now, other things I will show you that people usually try to compute using GHD are averages of conserved quantities, averages of uh, conserved densities and conserved currents. Okay, so, uh, so associated to each conserved quantity, which was this capital QI in my GGE earlier on, uh, there is a density, which would be a function such as this. And there is a conservation equation that relates this density to the corresponding current for a given conserved quantity QI. And one uh, interesting result is that this can be computed also in terms of the sorts of functions that you saw in the previous slide. So again, if you know what N is, uh, you use these TBA-like uh, equations, you solve them systematically, and you can compute these average currents and densities. Now, in our work, uh, the main thing that we have looked at, because it's visually the most informative, I think, is the particle density. So the particle density is something that has a very clear physical meaning. So that is what we call Q0, 
okay? Um, in terms uh, about the effective velocity, so Takato told us something yesterday, but just to give you some intuition, if the theory is free, the effective velocity is just tangent theta because it's just sinh divided by cosh in our case. But if a theory is not free, essentially what happens is that as time passes, particles kind of collide uh, with each other. And as they collide, they get usually a little bit slowed down. So their effective velocity tends to be a little bit less than plus or minus one, which is essentially velocities you get from a tangent. Okay? And so, uh, so this effective velocity profile gets modified in interacting theories, but usually doesn't get modified very much. Like if you look at Sinch Gordon, it's a very small change. But if you look at this model, I'm going to talk about this effective velocity changes its shape quite substantially. And so it's quite interesting to, to look at it. And so um, in my talk, I'm going to talk about three functions. I'm going to show you pictures of three types of functions. The first function is going to be this spectral particle density. So this is actually the integrand in this integral for q0. Okay? So this is the function whose integral gives you the particle density okay, as a function of space-time. Uh, the particle density itself, therefore, is this function here. Okay? So it, when you look at 3D pictures of this function, you have to think that if you integrated that volume, or if you integrated, sorry, on, on theta, in the theta direction, what you get is the particle density. Okay? And then you have already seen the effective velocity. So these are the three sorts of pictures that we are going to see. All right? Okay, so let's see what, what happens then. Most of the pictures I'll show you are going to be for one of the particles. Remember, in my model there were two, so I will show you for plus, but um, for minus, there's the party transformation that relates them to each other. So usually they are mirror reflections of each other. So I'll just show you one of them um, and uh, mention the other one is, one is needed. Okay, so out of equilibrium. So how do we go out of equilibrium? There are many ways in which we can put a system out of equilibrium, but the way that we thought would be more interesting for our problem would be to have an initial condition, an initial state, which is characterized by a temperature profile. Okay, so essentially at time equals zero, our model, our system, is in a Gibbs ensemble for every value of the position, but it's a different Gibbs ensemble for every x. And it is such that for x0, here in the middle, there's a temperature that is pretty high. And then as we go away, the temperature gets smaller uh, in a Gaussian way. And these temperatures, we have called them Tm and Ta. I will refer to this lower temperature as the bath temperature, because effectively, since this is infinitely large, this, um, well, if Ta is finite, you have some sort of bath at low temperature that is present there. We will see later that whether or not this bath is present actually makes quite some difference. So there are some new effects that appear when the bath is there that are not there if it's not. Um, so we found that choosing such a profile was quite ideal because what happens, in fact, is that if we choose this temperature Tm to be quite large, so in the region where there is interaction and there are unstable particles, what we are doing here really is that we are preparing the system initially in such a way that around x0, we have a high density of these unstable particles, and then they are released into a cold environment. And as they get released, essentially they start to decay because there isn't enough temperature, enough energy to sustain them. And that process actually leaves some signatures, for example, tails in certain functions. You can literally see somehow these particles decaying and slowing down and so on. Um, so yeah, there's two situations with and without bath. And it's worth saying, and actually, uh, actually Takato said that in his talk yesterday, that that's this sort of problem, this sort of initial uh, condition, uh, can be solved. Uh, I mean, it's usually solved uh, by uh, a method of characteristics. So mathematically speaking, there is a method to, to solve it, which can then be um, converted into a numerical method. But uh, in our work, we didn't actually use that because we were lucky that there was already an algorithm written by somebody else to solve this kind of problem. Um, so um, Frederick Müller and his supervisor, Schmidt Meyer, they wrote a code which is called iFluid. It's in MATLAB. And this code is freely available in GitHub. So you can just take it. You can plug in your S metrics, your, your model, and then you can run it for your particular problem. Uh, I have to say it wasn't trivial. We had to do quite a few modifications, which our stu the students did. But in the end, it, it did work very well. So I really recommend it if, if you don't want to write a new code again and <laughs> want to work on this. Okay, so 
Let's uh, come to some results now, some pretty pictures. Um, and you tell me if I run out of time, I don't know. I'm not keeping track, really. <laughs> so um, let me tell you something about equilibrium first, because even at equilibrium, these models, they have, uh, this model has some, some new features that you don't usually find. So let's imagine for a moment that we, uh, oh, sorry, ah, that we go back to this picture here, this profile, and we look at the equilibrium situation at x0. So we're going to look at theory in a Gibbs ensemble at this temperature Tm, okay? And we're going to look at the um, spectral density in that case. So that function I call rho p earlier. So rho p at equilibrium is a function of theta only, because x and t are fixed. Uh, so let's look at that function for a moment at a high temperature Tm. And let's compare it to what a free fermion would look like. So uh, people that are familiar with this, they would immediately recognize this uh, free fermion uh, distribution for the density of states or the spectral density. So in a free fermion at a certain temperature, this spectral density has essentially two symmetric peaks around the values plus and minus log of beta half, where beta is inverse temperature. Now, if you look at our particle plus at a quite high temperature, so log 2 Tm is 9, so temperature is exponential 9, essentially, and we are choosing in this example sigma equals to 10, okay? So sigma half is 5, which is below 9, so 9 is a high temperature. There are unstable particles. What you see here is that uh, there are three peaks instead of two, so that's already a novelty, it's something new. If you look at particle minus, it would be a mirror reflection of that, so they are all reversed. And if you look at this one at the top here, this one is identical to that one. It's exactly like a free fermion. And this is because of the structure of the kernels that I told you earlier. Because the kernels are centered around sigma or minus sigma, interaction is maximized for some sign of the rapidity. In this case, it's for theta negative. But for theta positive, these particles are essentially not interacting with each other. So the distribution is essentially free. And we usually call this free fermion peak. But if you look at the other side, here there is interaction and the density increases by some big amount. So this is a bigger peak. We call this the interacting peak in our, in our papers. And then in the middle, there's this little one, which is centered around this value. So log 2 Tm minus sigma. So this has a precise location. And what we discover in our first paper is that if you look at the area of this peak, which would be the particle density of plus, so part, the particle density associated to that peak, so if you look at this area, and you look at the excess area of this peak compared to a free fermion, they are the same, roughly. And what that, that allows for interpretation, if you, look at the, uh, if you look at the spectral density for particle minus, essentially what that tells you is that this little density here, these are exactly, this is exactly the density of particles plus that have bounded with minus to form un unstable bound states. So even though the unstable bound states are not officially in the spectrum because they are not asymptotic particles, somehow you can infer a stable density of these particles by looking at these pictures here somehow. So they have this effect. And if you, if you reduce the temperature and you go below the threshold for their formation, this peak disappears again. And it looks, again, more like free fermion. So this is the complete equilibrium, interaction, non-interaction. Now if you, let's go to local equilibrium. So let's now look at the whole function over the whole um, Gaussian profile is still at time zero, okay? So there's still no evolution. But let's look at this function. So here we have the 3D version of the function I just showed you. So it still has these three peaks, but now they're extended because we are looking at all x, okay? All values of x. So they are highest at x zero, and then they decrease as you go away. And you can see that when you go to x a little bit far, this little peak here has kind of disappeared. This is where all the unstable particles and how are for uh, concentrated. So they have these names we gave them in, in our papers. We decided to call them free interacting and subsidiary peak. And if you look at the effective velocity profile, which is this picture here, it's quite interesting too. So there's something interesting that happens at, at equilibrium. So you see that most of the time, so the red is essentially plus one, the blue is minus one. So most of the time, the effective velocity looks like a tunge, right? So it's essentially, it, it goes through several values around theta zero. Uh, but most of the time is either plus one, minus one. So tunge shape, center around theta zero. So this, uh, this, direction, this direction here is rapidity, rapidity space, okay? For time zero, a function of x. But around x zero, you see that this uh, effective velocity changes its shape quite a lot. Um, in fact, 
uh, it, it kind of here in the middle it has another plateau, so it kind of gets displaced. It's like you get a tange profile, but it's moved from the center. It has now moved to a place which is actually exactly the value of minus sigma half. Sigma was 10 here. So you, this, you see a displaced profile, which you can link again to the formation of these unstable particles. And in between, actually, there are all these intermediate velocities. So you actually see some intermediate uh, plateau in the velocity appearing, which is not at plus one or at minus one. So somehow, when these particles plus and minus meet at sufficiently high energy, they form these unstable particles, and they get sort of slowed down by this interaction process. So this is all static yet. So let's see what happens when you put some dynamics in, in the problem. So let's look now at pictures functions of time. So now we take this function and you make it, all these functions, we make them evolve. So this was more or less our picture now. Here the peaks are not so well separated because the temperatures chosen are different. But if you look at what happens, you see that when you switch on time, these peaks stop moving. This free fermion peak moves with velocity plus one. This interacting peak moves with velocity minus one. And this uh, little peak, it moves with velocity uh, plus one mostly, so it's kind of following this one. But what you see is that after a certain time, it kind of has disappeared. And instead of being there, actually it has left behind, it is a bit lighter blue, and hopefully you can see it, it has left behind this whole tail of slower particles. So essentially, inside, this, uh, inside that peak in there, there was a spectrum of velocities that were less than one. And so as it propagates, and as it goes into this cold bath, cold environment, it's essentially these particles start to slow down and this peak disintegrates. And this can be interpreted as a signature of these particles decaying, okay? There are other ways in, in which one can see that, but this is one, one of them. When you integrate this function in rapidity space, you get the particle density, which is these functions here. And so the particle density has the usual bump splitting form that you find also for free, free fermion or other theories. But the two bumps are now asymmetric because of this parity breaking. And you see that one of them has this sort of tail attached. And although it doesn't seem very significant in this picture, if you contrast it with a free fermion, you, see this, uh, you can see the difference very clearly. So there is this tail of decaying particles attached. And then if you look at effective velocity, it looks a lot like the picture I just showed you, except that this feature here follows this little peak. It kind of propagates with it because it is really due to those unstable particles. So it doesn't change very much in time. It just moves kind of a speed, a speed one. Now this situation here actually is for some parameters, which I think I've written down here. So some velocity, which is above the threshold of formation of particles. Uh, just to tell you that uh, plus and minus are related. For example, the effective velocities are related in this way, by a parity transformation. And um, so what do we see? Uh, uh, I think I've said all of these, all of these things. So we have formation of tail and decay. Oh, two minutes. Okay, that's short. Okay, so I'll, I think I'll show you. Well, a couple of slides more, and that's it. Um, so this was all without bath. So this is a situation. There is no bath, so there's just decay. Now, what happens if you have a bath? If you have a bath, uh, a cold bath in particular, so low temperature, then you see a new feature, which is quite interesting. So. If you look at, here is again the uh, spectral density of particle plus, but just for X positive. So we're just looking at the peaks that propagate with positive velocity. And this is the density of particle minus in the same region. And what you see here is that at the beginning it looks quite similar to what happened before. But now um, this uh, little peak, instead of completely disintegrated, it disintegrating, it actually disintegrates a bit. And then there's a bit of it that persists for long times. And it actually, if you look at the picture, there are two lines here that are lighter blue. Those two lines are essentially the contribution to the spectral density of the bath. So the bath itself produces these two little ridges in there of matter, or some non-vanishing density of particles. So this surviving peak somehow seems to be traveling on top of this bath at velocity uh, plus one. Now, how can that happen? So if you look at, if you actually compute the velocities of the particles inside this peak, you actually, the propagation velocities, you can actually see they are less than one. And that seems a bit contradictory. So this peak is traveling at speed one and it's being preserved, but it looks like the particles in it should be decaying as in the previous situation. They're still of the same speed as before. So what is happening uh, here? Well, uh, what we, the way we interpreted this phenomenon is like a, a, a new magnetic phenomenon in a way. So, uh, I'll show you that in the next 
slide here. So I had a little video, but I don't know if it's worth showing, given the time. Um, so this is the same picture again. Um, so what has happened? Well, these are the particles minus. And these particle minus, they have this peak that's propagating at velocity 1. And this is their interacting peak. So this peak of particles of the other type is interacting with this bath of particles of type plus. And uh, essentially, through this interaction, it's kind of carrying this uh, surviving uh, density of particles is carrying them as, as if it were a magnet somehow. So it looks a little bit, um, yeah. <coughs> and, and, and through that interaction, it's allowing for this persistent peak uh, to form. So this is a little bit like a magnet. I don't know if, uh, if that will work. But I had a video here, yeah, of a magnet. Um, so, um, oh, don't show that. Let me show you this. So it's a little bit as if you have a, a magnet and you, and you have something magnetic inside this pot and you pass the magnet and the magnetic particles somehow follow the magnet. So in this case, this, uh, this, uh, this peak here, this density of particles type plus, they don't have themselves the velocity, but they are following this magnet that is going by very fast. Okay? So, and that's giving rise to this persistent density of, of particles. Okay? Um, you can see that in this, in this other video as well. This is just comparing the situations with and, and without the bath. So without bath, we just decay. With the bath, you have this little density that persists uh, in time. OK, sorry. So um, I had a little something here, but it's not important. Let me conclude, since I'm late. Um, so uh, what are the conclusions? So I think GHD can offer uh, new insights into scattering, decay, and formation of particles. I think that is a nice idea, because when I started studied unstable particles in my thesis, it always was, well, it was a pole in the S metrics. There wasn't really anything dynamic that I could see about them. But in an out of equilibrium situation, you can pretty much see them form and decay, which is quite, a, quite nice and very physical. And very nice you can do that in an integrable model. Um, so we have found these signatures of formation and of decay. And at the moment, we're working on another paper where we are investigating in more detail um, these features here, so kind of what is the decay rate, how things change with different parameters, and so on. So this will, will come up uh, very, come out soon, hope, I hope. So with this, I, I thank you very much, and I, I wish Uber uh, in bonne fête. <laughs> so one, one or two quick questions. Sorry, I always have a question, obviously. Well, that's good. That's good, because this so is So I have to admit, I always felt uncomfortable with the concept of decaying particles in an integrable system. And I always thought they were a little bit formal. But now you're saying that it can really be observed. You can really observe the emergence of such particle, and then it's decay. Mm -hmm. How is it compatible with conserved quantities? Um, well, I mean, I know it's a, it's a bit of a conundrum, but somehow everything you do in integrable models, including the conserved quantities, you always relate it to the stable constituents of the theory. So somehow um, the things that play an active role are the stable particles there. Okay. Then stable particles are not present in the asymptotic spectrum. So in a way, um, I mean, I don't think they interfere with the conservation of charges or not. All of those discussions, they pertain to the stable constituents. But somehow the fact that they are there has some, it changes some of the features of these stable particles. And those changes is what you can observe. Okay. So you never observe the unstable particle itself, but you observe signatures that is hidden there somewhere and is having an effect. And um, well, that's very that's interesting. That's pretty interesting. Very challenging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it's cute, but Thank you. nobody agrees with me. <laughs> Thanks. Okay.